Welcome to lecture 16 of Networks Friends, Money and Bytes. And we will be talking about the cloud today. We'll look at what is inside the cloud. Now, if I ask you the question, where is your computer? You may say, well, it's uh, my laptop, my desktop, maybe my phone, maybe my tablet. But if you think about computer as a collection of computing and storage resources together with software and hardware, maybe the answer is that it's in the cloud. What is cloud? Now, when we draw computer network diagrams, we often say that maybe there is an end user machine, and maybe there's some database out there, maybe there's some switch around here, and then people are lazy. So they just draw something like a cloud to say, well, this is the network. Okay, it's the internet, could be the wireless core network. There's a lot of stuff in it, but I'm just skipping uh, the detailed drawing. So I just draw a cloud shaped uh, object. And that is where the word cloud uh, came from. For example, famous cloud services, including Apple's iCloud. Okay, you can store your music and your file over there. You can even recognize your music and then automatically synchronize and download and upload. Google announced Chromebook in 2011. This is a laptop that has basically nothing in it except internet connectivity. And everything you want to do is over the internet somewhere inside this cloud. The processing power, the software, the storage, they're all not co-located with the uh, input-output device of this Chromebook. If you think about this, this is actually a trend that started way back. For example, web-based email systems, such as Gmail, web-based software systems, such as Microsoft 365, and storage of documents. such as Google Docs or Dropbox. These are the kind of storage that is provided sometimes for free, at least uh, initially, uh, are inside the network. And the list can go on. So you can see that other than your input and your output, which must be located uh, near you, everything else is sort of remote. And they need to be stored somewhere. The processing needs to be carried out somewhere, and that somewhere is often called data centers. Okay. Data center is a gigantic building, okay. and inside there are different stories, and then many rooms. Each room is pretty big with many racks of machines. These machines include servers, storages, and switches that connect these servers and storage devices together. And who's going to use this big facility? Well, you and me, many people. Many people will use this as a rented and shared facility, okay, shared by many. These could be consumers. It could be enterprises. So it could be you and me. It could be, for example, Target, which is the second largest retail chain in the United States uh, do not operate its own dedicated facility. It uses use a, a data center. Now, to be general, data center actually can refer to dedicated facility, okay, only serving a particular company. Okay, for example, Google runs many data centers that just runs Google services, including search that we saw back in lecture three. And then there are also the shared and rented facilities. Okay. So how big can this data center be? Well, each of the biggest data centers can be over 300,000 square feet big. It can uh, house over half a million servers. And it can cost many hundreds of millions of dollars to build and hundreds of millions of dollars to maintain each year. So you can view each data center as a billion dollar operation. 
So if you are talking about you know 2050 data centers, uh, we're talking about 2050 billion dollars. And there are three dominant uh, shared data center uh, providers. Uh, Amazon's got a service called EC2, Microsoft got Azure, and Google got App Engine. Okay, all these belong to the class of shared data center that used to enable cloud services. And this is a field where there are so many different names attached to it. Okay, cloud computing, cluster computing, utility computing, software uh, as a service, and so on and so forth. Okay, and some people also say the majority of the ingredient in data center design were available for uh, decades. Okay, and there were vision that says one day all computing will be done away uh, in some remote location. And that vision has been out there for like at least 15, 20 years. But now, with a collection of technological and business shapers, for example, the technology of virtualization, for example, the business uh, case of uh, renting the cloud services to enterprises and consumers, finally, this vision has been realized. If you look at the market segment here, and to clarify our terminology a little bit, we can, broadly speaking, classify three parties in this ecosystem. Okay. There are the cloud providers, which actually uh, build, manage, operate data centers. Okay. So they provide the hardware, including the building itself. And then there are service providers, which run software on top of these data centers. These software providers could be, for example, uh, Apple okay, running iCloud. In that case, the service provider is actually also the cloud provider. It's the same company. Okay? But they could also be uh, separate companies. For example, it could be um, a startup that you created to sell your uh, app. Okay, So it's an iOS. Uh, app and uh, this app say requires some storage of data and you say that I don't want to build my own server farms I want to rent a piece of the uh, data center available from Amazon okay so Amazon in that case is the cloud provider and this uh, app writer or company is the service provider and then of course they will collectively in this dotted box provide the overall experience to the cloud users. Okay. And there are quite a few important ingredients. Uh, as we just saw, we of course need computing and storage, and we need large scale ones. Okay. Not just to scale it up to you know, a department wide, this got to scale up to hundreds of thousands uh, of servers and storage devices. We, of course, also need networking capabilities. And this is naturally the focus of our study. We actually need a few different kinds of networks. We need networks within a data center. And in fact, that is the focus of today's lecture. How do you scale up a data center? Within a data center, you've got um, servers, and you've got uh, storage devices, and you need to connect them somehow through some switches. You also need the network across data centers. Okay, let's say Google have one data center here near San Francisco, another one, say, near New York, then uh, how would you connect them? And then you, of course, need networks to the consumers or the enterprises through an access network. Okay. For example, your Wi-Fi network. Now, today we will be focusing on networks within data centers. And these two topics we have discussed already a little bit in previous lectures, and we'll talk more about access network later. All right, so that's the second piece, networking. And then the third piece is software, all kinds of software, from graphic user interface, GUI, to digital rights management, DRM, for example. How do I know that you actually have the rights to store and view this particular content? In some cases, like Apple's iCloud, they give you some leeway in DRM. 
of your stored music. We need security and privacy. This extremely important issue, and we also need billing. Okay, for example, in、uh, Amazon's S3 cloud service today, you can pay 0.115 dollars for each hour to get a small standard instance. Okay, it's a combination of computing,、uh, processing, and also storage、uh, capabilities. Okay, and Data networking coming in is free, okay, and going out of the、uh, EC2 unit of Amazon is going to、uh, be billed. Okay, the first gigabyte might be free, and then, for example,、uh, a recent price is zero point one two zero for each gigabyte that you send out. For example, to download back to your local machine. Okay, so we also need billing software, and now all three kinds of ingredients are ready: large-scale computing, storage, networking, and software. Now you may wonder, what if I open up my own desktop? Okay, my desktop. You think laptop maybe not powerful enough processing, but I got a pretty powerful、uh, desktop at home. I'm going to open it up. Okay, I got some input and output、uh, ingress out egress capacity. Uh, through my、uh, internet service provider like AT&T or Comcast, and I got some CPU power and some storage right here. So I'm going to become a cloud provider. Well, well, if you define the word cloud provider as such, then sure,、uh, it, you can be self-consistent. But、uh, normal people, when they say cloud, they mean、uh, they must have some defining characteristics.、Okay. One of which is on-demand in timing. I can change my request for resources in a short time scale. Okay. The other is on demand in scale. So I can go from the minimum, which is a very small、uh, amount of resources, like a 1.7 gigabyte of RAM, and let's say 160 gigabyte of memory. Uh, storage、uh, on Amazon's EC2 today, okay, and、um, uh, I can be a customer. Okay, Amazon say good, you are on. Okay, and yet I can go to a huge scale. For example, an entire company can run all its enterprise、uh, software services on a rented cloud, like Target. So your own desktop opening up. As a cloud provider, probably is not on demand in timing, and definitely not on demand in scale. You cannot possibly scale to such a large scale. Okay, so the key thing here is it got to be on demand, and we're going to especially zoom in on this scale factor in the next、uh, module of the lecture.